this is a great looking crowd tonight. I, I can't see, no, 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 I can't see you. It's dark and I, I don't have my glasses on, but uh, from what I can see, you're a great looking crowd tonight. Uh, how many of you, this is your very first time at ISA? For, very first time, okay, good. Let's welcome our newcomers, good. How many of you have been here for at least, uh, for at least seven, you've lived, been here for at least seven uh, conventions? You've been here for at least seven, okay? Look, no, wait, 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 look around you. These are all of them that cannot pass their paces, okay? <laughs> and they're still in ninth grade, all right? Excellent. Well, whether this is your first time or your seventh time, or sometime in between. We're so glad that you've come this year to ISC. It's hard to believe that this is our last night. Hard to believe. Uh, tomorrow you'll hear one final devotion. Uh, you'll have a final awards assembly. And then you'll get back in the van and you'll travel for 27 and a half hours <laughs> to get home. And I know that you only live in Indianapolis, but it's that the van is just that bad. I know. <laughs> How many of you have at least a 12-hour drive home? At least a 12-hour, okay? That was, that was not a good time to cheer, okay? Um, how many of you are taking the airplane home? Would you raise your hand, okay? Excellent. How many of you believe that we should take a Democratic vote right now and, and, and ask that our school administrator would upgrade our plane tickets to first class on the way home, okay? Now, I, 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 th I want this to be fair, I want, so I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes, okay? No, 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 bow your head and close your eyes. Nobody looking. Now, if you would say, Pastor Skelly, I believe that my school administrator should pay the money to upgrade my ticket, would you raise your hand up good and high? All across the, okay, I see those hands. You may lower them. How many say, I do not believe that we should have an upgraded first class ticket and I think that we should sit in the back of the plane and coach section. Would you raise your hand? Okay. I see, th I see three school administrators. Okay. All right. Look up here. Guess what guys? You're flying first class. Of course, you won't have a Christian school next year because you just went into debt, but uh, it'll be a wonderful trip home. I want you to open your Bibles tonight for this final evening session of ISC. I want to talk to you about something very important tonight. Perhaps the most important topic that you'll ever hear of, we'll talk about tonight. And I, I know that we have a big room and I know that some of you are, are way up there in the nosebleed sections. I know that some of you are, are having a, a difficult time, maybe I'm having a difficult time seeing you. But I, I want you to know tonight that I'm preaching to you. Whether or not I ever make eye contact with you, I'm preaching to you tonight. I've prayed for you. Not by name, I don't know all of your names, but, but I've prayed for you. And I've prayed tonight that, that God would speak to your heart. So I don't want you to get the idea tonight that you're just one among thousands, because you're not. No, you're an individual person whom God has created for His glory. And whenever God's Word is opened, God has a specific message for you. And I want you in the next few moments, I want you to understand that. And as the Word of God is, is preached and as I share some thoughts that are upon my heart, I, I just want you to le let those words settle down on your heart. I want you to know that God has an incredible plan for your life. Whether you're an eighth grade girl or a 12th grade boy getting ready to graduate, regardless of who you are or where you're from, makes no difference if you're rich or poor, if you're American or Mexican or Filipino or... I wanted to throw that in there for my Filipino friends. But it really doesn't make a difference who you are. God has a plan for your life. Would you open your Bible tonight to James chapter 4? The book of James tonight, in chapter 4, and I want you to do me a favor. I want you to keep your Bible open. James chapter 4 tonight in your Bible, and keep your Bible open. Would you look at James chapter 4 and verse 13? All the way in the back, all the way up here on this side. James chapter 4, and look please if you would at verse 13. 
The Bible uses these words. Ready? Here it is. Go to now. That's just an old English term. Go to now. You know what that means? Go to now. Here's what it means. It means, hey, listen up. It means, hey, listen up. It's almost as if James, the author of the book, is writing about some important topics, and he is. He's talking about the, the value of, of guarding our tongue, the value of elevating a, a, a faith that, that has works that follow it. He's talking about uh, the value of not respecting uh, persons, but treating everyone just the same. The value of standing uh, true in temptation. He's talking about a lot of important things. But right in the middle of the letter that James is writing, he says to his readers, he says, uh, hey, hey, listen up. Because he's about to deal with some things that they were doing and some plans that they were making. Look at it. James 4 and verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Look at what it says. Whereas you know not what should be on the morrow. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Whereas, you know not what should be on the morrow. For what is your life? Do you see that on the paper in front of you? Do you see it? What is your life? It's the only time in the Bible the question is asked. What is your life? Not, not only what is life. People have been trying to figure that thing out for years. What is life? Biologists for years have been trying to figure out what is life? When does life begin? Uh, philosophers for years have tried to come up with a meaning for life. What is life? But you know, the Bible tells us in James chapter 4 and verse 14 what life is because the question is asked and then God answers the question because God never asks a question because He doesn't know. God asks questions because we don't know. And so the Bible says what is, not only what is life, but what is your life? You can put your name right in that verse. What is your life? You can say it this way. What is my life? What is your life? And then watch how God defines it. You see it there in verse 14? Look at it. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, what they were saying was in verse 13, but Here's what you ought to be saying. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But, but now, you rejoice in your boastings. You're you're, you're not saying what you're supposed to be saying. You're not living the way you're supposed to be living. You're not having the perspective you're supposed to be having. But, But now, you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, look at verse 17. Therefore, to him... Or, or to her, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I want to talk for a couple minutes tonight on this topic. What is your life? Father, I'm asking. I'm asking tonight for a holy hush upon this place. God, tonight I'm asking that you would move mightily by your Spirit in the hearts and minds of of young people and and even chaperones, ACE staff members. Lord, work in my heart. God, tonight I pray that you give us a, a sense of your presence in this room. May we know that we know that you're here tonight. I pray that your word would find fertile soil in our hearts. Oh God, tonight I pray that you would do an eternal work in our hearts, in our lives, in our very soul tonight. Oh God, do a work. Lord, we need you desperately. And I'm asking tonight that you would make this an impactful time for every single one. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you three thoughts tonight. First of all, if you're taking notes tonight, write down this. I believe God tonight wants us to reconsider our plans. I believe God tonight wants us to reconsider our plans. It's not wrong to have plans. 
Some of you are more organized than other people. You've got a, a little a day planner or maybe you've got a smartphone and you've got your Google app on your phone and you make plans and you know what you're going to do at 2 o'clock on next Thursday. I don't even know what I'm going to do five minutes from now. Okay, but some people are organized people. And quite honestly, you organized people bother me. Okay, just so you know that. But it's not wrong to be organized. Uh, it's not wrong to, to kind of know what you want to do with your life. Uh, some of you are, you know, uh, like in sixth grade and, and you, you already want to be like a, a, a nuclear engineer. Good for you. You know, I, I wanted to be a fireman, okay? I'm just saying. I remember doing a, a graduation service years ago and uh, there were five kindergartners that were graduating from this Christian school and uh, there were two high school graduates and uh, the, the administrator called and asked me, would you preach a dual graduation? Uh, preach uh, for the kindergartner uh, graduation, preach for the high school graduation. It's all the same service. I said, I'd be happy to. And so that night I, I, I preached a message, but before I did, the, the five kindergartners came up on the platform and, and they put a microphone in their, in their uh, near their mouth and said, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, the first uh, little girl said, uh, you know, I want, to, I want to be a doctor. I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive, you know. They talked to the boy, what do you want to be, you know? Oh, I want to be a, I want to be a policeman, you know. Guys, we, it took us a little, a little bit longer to talk, you know. I want to be a policeman. And then the third one, you know, what do you want to be, this, this, this girl? And, you know, she wanted to be some guy, like an engineer or something. Girls, you're always showing us up. What's your problem? But there she was. And then the fourth, then here's the fourth boy. That was not a time to clap. And then the fourth, the fourth boy, I, I want to be a fireman. <laughs> and the whole time that they're, they're giving their, their plans, the, the fifth girl over here, she's not paying attention at all. No, she's cute, and she knows she's cute. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Yeah, and some of you are like that. So she's over here, and she's got her white dress on, and she's just kind of doing this thing and going around like this, and, you know. And finally, they, they came over to her and said, Honey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she says, I want to be a I want to be a princess. <laughs> and I'm like, girlfriend, you are already there. I'm not telling you that right now. <laughs> I'm telling you. You know, I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about that. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, it's really not the best question, is it? I'm not saying that desires are wrong things. and I'm not saying it's wrong to have ambition, aspirations, dreams. I think we need to be dreamers. But listen to me. You better make sure tonight that every dream, every ambition, every aspiration, every plan that you have in life, you better make sure tonight that you take them and lay them at the feet of Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, it really doesn't make a difference what you want to do with your life. What is it that God, Almighty God, wants you to do with your life? We are His workmanship. Listen, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. That tells me that God has things He's already planned for me to do. That means God has a work that He's already planned for me to do. What is it? It would bother me if I were a teenager not to know, God, what is it? But I would spend every day of my life spending some time alone with God, saying, God, direct me and guide me and teach me and show me. I don't want to miss your will for my life. And so part of that, part of that is you being willing to reconsider your plans. I want you tonight to reconsider your plan. I know what you're going you're gonna to go to college. I know that you're, you're going to get married. I, I know that one day uh, you're going to live here. I know what all your plans are. I'm just asking tonight that you would reconsider them for just a moment. Watch what happens in verse 13. Look at it, verse 13. Watch what happens. The Bible says, go to now. Hey, hey, listen up. Go to now, ye that say today... That, that's a time term, isn't it? Today or tomorrow. That's a time term, isn't it? 
today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a city. We'll continue there a year. That's a time term. Three times in one verse, people were planning their lives based upon the time, listen to me, the time they thought they had. They were planning their whens. W-H-E-N. They were planning their whens. Hey, I've got time. I'm going to go to this city today or, or maybe tomorrow. I'm going to stay there for a whole year. I'm planning the whens of my life. Can I just say this? You do not control the whens of your life. I was sitting in eighth grade algebra class. That's like going through the second half of the tribulation period. <laughs> I was in Bible college. This is long before there were cell phones. I was in Bible college and I was in my dormitory room. And it was late one Wednesday night and I heard a knock at our door. That's not a door, that's a pulpit, but I'm just pretending it's a door. I heard a knock at the door and a kid said, hey Kurt, you've got a, a phone call. Back in those days, if someone had to wanted to contact me at the dorm, they have to call the, the, the pay telephone. Um, how do I explain that? Look that up in the history, look that up in the history books or go to an antique shop. And uh, so I went down to the laundry room where the, where the pay telephone was and sure enough there was a phone call for me. I picked up the, the phone and on the other end of the phone was a, a friend of mine from high school who was at another college many, many hundreds of miles away. They said, uh, Kurt, did you hear the news? I said, what news? The news about, about Terry. I said, no, I, I, I didn't hear the, what, 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 Terry? I mean, Terry, ter Terry was the, the most godly girl in our, in our youth group growing up and in our, in our church. She, uh, Terry was the kid that everybody liked. She was the one that encouraged everybody. Terry uh, was a, a year older than I. She, she would come and, and pick up my brother and me to, for youth activities and, and drive us to church sometimes. And uh, Terry, she was an encourager. And Terry, what, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? What happened to Terry? Uh, Kurt, you didn't hear, obviously. Tonight, uh, on the way home from ch Wednesday night church, she was in a Jeep with several other college students, including her fiancé, who was studying to be a, a youth pastor. Kurt, the, the Jeep careened off the road and hit a tree. And I don't know how to tell you this, Kurt, but, but Terry died tonight. Now, I can't tell you the feeling that, that enveloped my body. As an 18-year-old college kid. I mean, Terry, come on. She, she's full of life. Terry, come on. She's, she's called of God to go to ministry. Terry, come on. She's engaged to be married. Terry, Terry, come on. She's 19 years old. Greg was one of my best buddies. Every Saturday morning, I would see Greg pull his car up in front of my apartment as a young married, young married man. I would go to downtown Chicago every Saturday morning. I would preach to about 400 homeless men at the rescue mission in downtown Chicago. Greg would come and drive me over an hour drive to downtown Chicago. He'd always have a cup of coffee waiting for me and the car would be warm and Greg just wanted to be a blessing. What a friend. I'd get in the car and Greg and I would talk about his young wife and talk about his, his, his children, and four young children. We'd talk about life and talk about plans and talk about the Lord and talk about people that were going to hear the gospel that day. And Greg was such a wonderful friend. I'll never forget the day when I got the news that he had succumbed to the awful disease of leukemia and left that wife and left those four children. Todd was, Todd was quite a man. Todd was a football player and Todd was a big strapping kind of guy. He was an outdoorsman, loved to fish and hunt. Never forget the day that Todd said, uh, Pastor, I was a young pastor now, Pastor, I want you to come to my house for Christmas. Typically, I would celebrate Christmas with my own family, and 
wouldn't go to a church member's house on Christmas. It's kind of a family time, but, but this Christmas was different because I knew that this would be Todd's last Christmas. Todd had cancer, and the big football player kind of guy he was was now just a, a, a skeleton. He weighed about 100 pounds. He didn't want his little children to be able to come in the room because, Pastor, I don't want them to see me like this. I sat next to that big former football player by his bed and I held his hand on Christmas Day. And here's what I listened to. (gasps) Years later, I would sit by my dad's bedside and hear the same thing. He died at 56. Todd died at 32. Death is no respecter of persons. I know you've got great plans for your life, and I'm certainly not trying to be negative tonight, but I'm trying to be real. To say, hey, hey, listen up. You don't control the winds of your life as much as you want to, as much as you desire uh, to control time and how long you're going to be somewhere and how long you're going to live on planet Earth. You simply don't do it. It's in God's category. When? Not only were they considering, were they considering the whens of their life. Watch this, number two. They were planning the wares of their life. Do you see it in verse 13? Look at it. Go to now, ye that say today or, or tomorrow. Those are time terms. We will go into such and such a city. We're going to go to that city. We're going to go live there. That's where we're going to go. We're going to go live in, in that city. We can control the wares of our life. Hey, no prayer. No ask God. No seek for guidance. Uh, no ask counsel uh, and get some wisdom. No, we're going to go live there. Can I just say this tonight? You better get God in on all the where decisions of your life. I mean, I want you to ask a lot. I want you to ask a lot if the where decisions of life are important. Because he made a where decision that ruined his whole life. I want you to ask Abraham if the where decisions of life are important. Because he made a where decision and went to Egypt and ruined his whole life. Uh, I want you to ask Elimelech, that husband of Naomi, when he went to Moab, if the where decisions of life are important. Because I'm going to tell you something, they are vitally important. You better get God in on all your when and where decisions. Watch this, number three. Not only were they planning their whens, and not only were they planning their wheres, but watch this in verse 13. They were also planning their whys. W H Y. Look at it. Verse 13. Go to now. Hey, hey, listen up. Go to now, ye that say today or, or tomorrow. Uh, we'll go into such and such a city. That's, that's when. That's where. We'll continue there a year. That's when. Watch this. We'll buy. We'll sell. We'll get gain. That's why. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Man, we're going to kill it. Uh, we're going to start our business. We're going to go to that city. We're going to make money. And we're going to buy stuff, and we're going to live large, and we're going to have all good. Man, that's the why that I live for. Look at what I'm going to have. I'm not going to live in this dump. I'm not going to have what they have. Man, I'm going to make something of myself. The Bible says, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And in many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money. It's the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Run from them. Follow after righteousness and godliness. Faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Hey, a Timothy, said Paul, live for the stuff that will outlive you. Live for the stuff that will outlive you. Hey, the whens, the wheres, the whys. And James is saying, Stop! James is saying, stop, reconsider your plans because there's something I'm about to tell you that needs to get in your brain before you make one more decision. And so I said, number one tonight, reconsider your plans. Number two tonight, recognize this perspective. Look at it. 
Verse 14, recognize this perspective. Because when you're making all your plans about where you're going to go to college and what you're going to be in your life and what your career is going to be and how much money you're going to make and what you're going to do, listen, stop for a moment, stop for a moment and recognize this perspective. You don't even know what tomorrow brings. Whereas you know not what you're on tomorrow, for what is your life? When God defines your life, He defines it in three ways. Here they are, ready? What is your life? Number one, your life is fragile. Say that with me, ready? Your life is fragile. Matter of fact, I can't think of anything more fragile than vapor. Have you ever seen the morning fog in the morning? Maybe you live in a mountainous area and you're driving and the, 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 the fog's on the road. You can hardly see, but then the sun comes up and all of a sudden the fog is gone. Well, my brother and I were uh, just uh, small and, and uh, my mother would every morning make tea on the, on the stove. She'd put a pot of tea on the stove and it, it was a whistling teapot. And so when the water would steam, it, it would force its way out of that little hole at the top of the teapot and it would whistle. And so when the, when the teapot would whistle, you would know the, the water's boiling. And my brother and I, we, we'd, we'd sit there and watch the, the steam come out of that little hole and we'd watch the steam. We didn't have much of a life, did we? We'd watch the steam come out. And we'd try to see how high can it go up. But the funny thing is, after two, three feet, it was there, it was gone. It was there, it was gone. That's your life. That's your life. It's there and it's gone. It's fragile. Uh, not only that, what is your life? It's even, even a vapor, fragile. It appeareth for a little time. When God defines life, He defines life in terms of time. Her name was Mindy. M Mindy was a 10th grader in our school. I taught in a Christian school many, many years ago. And Mindy was a 10th grader in our school. And Mindy would sit on the front steps of, that, of the school every morning and she would just snap her fingers like this. And I said to Mindy one day, I said, Mindy, why do you do that? Why do you sit on the front steps and snap your fingers? She said, oh, Pastor Skelly, I've been going to the school for many years. Since I was just a little kid, and, and I've watched these, 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 these third and fourth graders, I remember when they were kindergartners, Pastor Skelly, and boy, how quickly the time goes by, and she snapped her finger. Oh, by the way, you know, Mindy today is 42 years of age. That's life. If you live to be age 70, and there's no guarantee that you will, the Bible talks about three score and ten. If you live to be age 70, do you know you'll live about 25,000 days? That's not a long time. 25,000 days. I'm fi I'll be 52 this year. If my life were a baseball diamond, I'm sliding into third base. My dad died at 56. My dad got cancer when he was my age. My grandfather died in his 40s. That's the way God defines life. It's fragile. You don't live forever. You don't even have tomorrow promised to you. You've got today. It's fragile. It's, it's, it's fleeting. It appears for a little time, and, and then it's gone. There, there's no, there's no, there's no do-over. There's no, there's no reset button. There's no rewind. No, it's here, and it's gone. Hey, it's fragile. It, it's fleeting. Hey, hey, it's final. It, 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 it appears for a little, it, it, it's a vapor. It appears for a little time, and then it, then it vanishes away. It's gone. Oh, people will lament, and uh, they'll, they'll cry for you, and and, and everyone thing will stop and, and they might even cancel school and, and they'll put you in a, in a coffin and, 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 and they'll walk by and, and they'll weep and they'll, they'll talk about you and they'll eulogize you but, but life will go on. And you will have entered eternity and you have no chance to come back and undo or redo anything. It's done. What's done is done. We don't have time to waste. We don't have another day to, to fritter away because life is time. And what are we doing with our time? Maybe that's why Solomon got to the end of his life and said, man, I chased the wind. I chased it all. I, I had all the pleasure. I had all the stuff. I, I had all the wives. I, I, had all the st I had all the wonderful things. And, and what was it? It was nothing. And, and so my one piece of advice is don't waste time. 
Remember now thy creator and the days of thy youth. Don't waste time. You have no time to waste. The world is dying and going to hell. And you have the message of the gospel. And God wants to use your life to make an impact for the cause of Jesus Christ. You don't have one day to waste. Reconsider your plans. Recognize this perspective. Watch this, number three, and lastly tonight. Not only should we reconsider our plans and then recognize this perspective, life. But number three, and lastly, repent. Repent of what, Pastor Skelly? Repent of your pride. Watch how the verses finish out. This is amazing. Look at it in verse 15. Uh, for, for, for that you ought to say, uh, what they were saying is, hey, uh, we're going to make, we're going to go here, we're going to go there, we're going to make money, look at what we're going to do. And James said, stop, stop. Do you even know that, that your life is a vapor? Do you know that you could die today? Do you know that only what's done for Christ will last? Do you know that life goes by like this? Do you know that? So stop. What you ought to be saying is, if the Lord will. We shall live and do this or that. In other words, the plans you ought to be making is you ought to be making plans based upon what does God want for my life. And so that's my question for you. What does God want for your life? Does that burn in you? What does God want you to do? Why did God put you in Mexico? Why did God plant you in Georgia? Why did God allow you to be raised in the Philippine Islands? Why did God put you in your home? Why are you in that Christian school? Because let me just tell you something. God has a supreme purpose for your life. And yet what we do, we strut around like our life belongs to us. We strut around, we strut around like it's my will, what I want to do. What's my, we even say it, it's my life. I'm 18, I can make my own decisions. Where do we ever come up with that? It's not your life. That's why the Apostle Paul incredulously said, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? You're not your own. Where did you get that idea that you belong to you? Where did you ever get that idea that somehow you have the right to make your own decisions? Uh, Jesus Christ paid for your life with his precious blood upon the cross of Calvary. <laughs> You're not redeemed with corruptible things. At silver and gold from your vein, a conversation received by tradition, tradition from your father. You've been, you've been redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Does that mean anything to you? Wow. What you ought to be saying is, God, what do you want? What you ought to be saying is, God, not my will, but thine be done. And Lord, I'd really love to be this, and I'd really love to go there. And Lord, I, you know the desire of my heart, but Lord, every desire, every aspiration, every dream, every ambition, oh God, like Abraham took the thing that he loved, God, I give it to you. Oh God, if you want to give it back, that's up to you, but God, I give it to you. I dare you, listen, I dare you tonight. I dare you, I challenge you tonight to take your dreams and ambitions and come to this old-fashioned altar and lay them down and say, God, my life belongs to you. Wherever, whenever, whoever, God, my life belongs to you. I challenge you. But you know what? Most people will never do it. That's my life. It's the pride of assuming. It's the pride of assuming that my life belongs to me. It's the pride. It's pride. It's pride that says, I will. I will. I will. Hey, there's somebody else famous in the Bible that said that five times. His name was Satan. It didn't work out too well for Nebuchadnezzar when he said, look at what I've done. Look at who I am. It didn't work out too well for Herod when he said, look at, him. Look, look at me. That's a danger, by the way, with being talented. That's a danger with working hard. You can come up here and you can sing so well and you can act so well. And sometimes we forget about the God that gave us every one of those gifts. Sometimes we forget about the God that gave us every one of those opportunities. At the end of the day, it is how great thou art.
But the average, I dare say, even Christian young person says, my life belongs to me. Repent. Repent of that pride. Your life does not belong to you. But not only do I see the pride of assuming, look at the, look at the next verse, verse 16. But now, what you ought to be saying is, God's will. I, I want to do God's will. I want to live and uh, please Him. But, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Look at me. Look at what I can do. Look at what I won. Look at how great I am. Give me praise. Give me applause. Give me. It's the pride of arrogance. It's taking the very gifts of God and using them not for His glory, but for your own. Boy, it happens in church. It happens in school. It happens all around the world. And you see very talented people in Hollywood and very talented people in the sports arena. Very talented people. But what I'm saying is talent without a love for God is meaningless. It's meaningless. The pride of assuming. The pride of arrogance. But the worst pride of all, the worst pride of all, the worst pride of all is verse 17. Look at it in closing. The worst pride of all, therefore, verse 17, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good. Let me ask you a question, guys. What's the good that we know to do? The good that we know to do in that passage is do the will of God. The good we know to do is don't make plans without checking with God. The good we know to do is remember that my life is this short, and if God wants to use me like a, uh, like a William Borden in Psalm 25, so be it. Or like a Ricky, or like a Terry, or like a Greg, or like a Todd, so be it, God. My days are numbered by you, not by me. Oh, God, I want to live my life for you, but when we know to do good, and every single person in this room knows it. There's not one person in this room that would deny in his heart of hearts that the only life worth living is a life lived within the will of God. There's not one person that would deny that. And yet we'll walk out of this room and we'll do the same old things we've always done. We'll live the same old mediocre, lukewarm, lackluster, half in, half out life that we lived. God's looking for somebody that's going to get serious. God's looking for somebody that's going to get da downright sober about the will of God. He's lo listen, he's looking for a teenager that's going to stand up in the middle of all of his friends and say, hey, excuse me, pardon me, I'm going to go give my life to Jesus Christ. If you follow, that's your prerogative, but it's not about you or you or you, it's about him, I'm going. It's about time that God got as much passion as the basketball court. God got as much passion as the co co competition field. Hey, it's about time that my heart, soul, mind, and strength went to loving Jesus Christ. Apathy. Let me tell you something. The great scourge of modern Christianity, the great scourge is apathy. We know, we know, we know, we know. We're like robots. We have all the verses memorized. We're like robots. We know all the words to the songs. We're like robots. We know what to wear. We know where to go. We know how to act. We're like Christian actors on the stage. And God's looking for real teenagers who say, I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. And I don't care who knows it. Matter of fact, I want everyone to know it. His name was Bill. Bill was not a nice person. Oh, that doesn't mean he wasn't successful. Bill was very successful. Uh, Bill was a, an incredible businessman, and he made a lot of money. But you know, Bill just spent his money on himself. And Bill just bragged about himself. And Bill just uh, fed himself and pleasured himself. And he basically was a, a hedonistic self-centered, not a nice person. Bill had a bad heart. Bill was taken to the hospital in the University of Phoenix, Arizona. And there Bill lay in the hospital for 149 days. Mad at God, mad at the world, mad at life, not a nice person. 
After 149 days, the news came in, Bill, we, we have found a perfect match for your heart. A perfect match. They rushed the, the heart of a person who had died, a perfect match, and they brought that heart in, and they transplanted a good heart into Bill's body where he had that bad heart. Over the next couple months, the doctors were amazed. Bill recovered remarkably well and very quickly. Six months had elapsed and Bill was doing great. He felt like he had a new lease on life and he was ready just to go out and do it all over again. But the law stipulated that after six months, the, the family of the person who donated the heart could contact the man who received the heart. And so at six months, a letter came to Bill. And Bill read a letter from the family of the man who had died and given Bill his heart. His name was Michael Brady. Michael was a, a healthy, young stuntman. He was preparing to do a stunt where he would actually parachute onto a train. But he didn't, he didn't die because of that stunt. He was climbing the ladder on the train to check out a few things, and he fell, hit his head, freak accident, and died. He was an organ donor, so they took his heart and rushed it to Bill, Bill Wall, in Arizona, and Bill received his heart. When Bill read that letter, Bill immediately felt guilty. He said, I I've spent my life being unkind. I I've spent my life feeding my own flesh. I've spent my life doing all the wrong things. And here's a young man who loved life and loved people and lived healthy, and now I have his heart, and he's gone. It changed Bill. He began to exercise fastidiously. He began to run marathons. He began to do good things for people. He began to, to give and help and serve. And it totally revolutionized his life. One day, a friend of mine told me, Michael's father, dead Michael, his father, came to visit Bill. Bill met the father of the man whose heart was now in his chest. And Bill looked at that man and said, Sir, thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Thank you that your son gave his life that I might have life. And here's what the man said. Are you ready? The father of Michael Brady said, I have a strange request for you. Bill said, anything. You, you've given me everything. Whatever request you have, that, that'd be fine. May I? May I put my ear up against your chest? I want to I want to hear the heartbeat of my son. Listen to me. God's son gave his heart for you. If you know Jesus Christ as your savior, the son of Je the heart of Jesus Christ beats within you. But my question to you is this. If God came to you today and put his ear against your life, would he hear the beating heart of his own son? Would he hear a, a passion and a love and a desire, a single-mindedness to say, only one life and so soon it will pass and only what's done for Christ will last. And Lord, I'm sorry for the days that have gone by and I'm sorry for the life I've lived, but God, from this day forward, I want to live my life for you because one day soon we're all going to be on the other side and there's no way to come back. And so God, I give you myself today. What about it? I challenge you. I dare you. I implore you, I encourage you tonight, give your life to Jesus Christ. It's the only life that matters, and you only have one shot. God bless these teenagers. God work in hearts 
Oh God, tonight I pray that you would give us a sense of the urgency of the hour. Oh God, tonight I pray that you'd give us a sense of your presence in our lives. God, may we dispense with the game playing. May we dispense with the, the acting and the, the, the stage presence. And oh God, tonight, would you just give us a baptism of reality. Oh God, tonight, help us once and for all to get serious about the work of Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed tonight. I want to ask you a couple questions. This is the time to be dead silent. This is the time to be zoned in. This is the time not to allow the devil to distract you one iota right now. Question number one. I have to believe in a room this size with this many people, I have to believe that some of you have been game players. I have to believe that some are sitting in this very room and do not have a assurance in their heart that they're on their way to heaven. I've got to believe there are people in this room that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And if you were to die today, like Ricky or Terry or Greg or Todd or anybody else that we talked about, you have no real hope that you'd go to heaven. Matter of fact, truth is, some would go straight to hell. 